Tonight, breaking news, civilians trapped as Putin tightens his grip on Ukraine. Russian troops closing in on Cherniv in the north. The mayor pleading for help. Mariupol still surrounded on all sides. An estimated 100,000 people stranded. The first images now emerging from inside the theater, bombed as women and children sheltered inside. 300 people killed in the attack. President Biden touching down in Poland today, meeting with American troops. The high stakes speech expected tomorrow as he heads to the epicenter of the refugee crisis. Supreme scandal. The personal text from the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas urging the White House to overturn the 2020 election. The messages she sent to President Trump's chief of staff. Tonight, the growing calls for Justice Thomas to recuse himself from cases related to the January 6th insurrection. Amusement park horror. A 14-year-old falling to his death at a theme park in Orlando. The chilling conversations with attendants moments before the ride took off. Authorities still searching for answers. How could this have happened? Tiger attack body cam video showing the chaotic moments after a man was mauled by a tiger. The victim, an employee at a Florida wildlife attraction. What he was doing inside the cage. Plus, murder suspect takedown. Police tracking down a man accused of beating someone to death at a Florida mosque. The confrontation in a parking lot caught on body cam why police say they were forced to open fire an eco tour Coldplay is back on tour playing to sold out stadiums in Costa Rica the revolutionary way they are making concerts more environmentally friendly how the energy of the fans is literally powering their performance top story starts right now And good evening on this Friday night. When it comes to bombing, Russia is not letting up. We begin top story with the dire situation on the ground in cities across Ukraine. The first image is now emerging from inside the Mariupol Theater. You may remember that was bombed as women and children sheltered inside. Ukrainian authorities say nearly 300 people were killed in that attack alone, which would make it the deadliest single incident since the start of this war. In the north, Russian forces closing in on Cherniv. The mayor driving through his hard-hit city, pleading for help. Russian shelling also hitting Kharkiv, the country's second largest city. Residents sent running as massive fires rage. The war sending more than two million refugees into neighboring Poland alone. President Biden touching down there today, visiting with American troops. Biden is expected to meet face to face with Ukrainians who have fled tomorrow. For the civilians still trapped in Ukraine, the situation grows more dire by the day, with no end to this war in sight. That is where we begin our coverage again tonight with Richard Engel leading us off from Kyiv. Russia is tightening its noose around yet another Ukrainian city. This time it's Chernihiv, which tonight is nearly surrounded and is fighting for its survival. In this video, the mayor showed the furious Russian attacks and called for assistance. Further south, the city of Mariupol is already completely surrounded, and its ruins stand in tragic testimony to the cost of Russia's siege warfare. Today, we saw the first images from inside a theater Russia attacked nine days ago. Ukrainians covered in dust who'd been sheltering inside looked stunned. As a narrator says, a missile hit the center of the theater. Officials in Mariupol said today around 300 people taking shelter in the building were killed. NBC News cannot verify the claim. It would be the single worst atrocity since the war began. But Russian President Vladimir Putin says Russia is the real victim, today accusing the West of engaging in cancel culture to erase Russia's identity, comparing it, as Putin often does now, to Nazi repression. As the Russian military announced it's consolidating its forces in the east. But even there, a U.S. military official says Russia is losing ground in the city of Kherson. Where Ukrainians have been standing up to Russian occupying forces, blocking the roads, refusing to back down, even in the face of gunfire. Tom, I think this announcement from the Russian military today that its core military objective is control of the east, the protection of the Donbass, is really a way for Russia to try and claim success out of failure. 
because the East is the only place where Russia's had some territorial gains, the only place where it is able to uh, control territory. And even there, it is struggling to hold the East. It's a major climb down, nothing like what Russia said it was initially planning to do, which was to take over this entire country, including Kyiv, and topple the government in just a matter of days. Tom. A strange statement from Russia. We'll have more on that later in the broadcast. Richard, thank you for that report. President Biden is in Poland tonight where he is recognizing that country's pivotal role in the refugee crisis, welcoming two million Ukrainians. The president also meeting with American troops in Poland who were rushed to bolster NATO at the start of this crisis. Chief White House correspondent Kristen Welker is traveling with the president tonight. Tonight, President Biden in Poland, ground zero of the refugee crisis. The country taking in more than two million refugees from Ukraine so far. The president meeting with Poland's president about the growing disaster. I'm here in Poland to see firsthand the humanitarian crisis. Earlier talking to U.S. troops stationed here and casting this moment in historic terms. Our democracy is going to prevail and the, and the values we share or autocracy is going to prevail. And that's really what's at stake. The National Security Advisor revealed today the White House is working on contingency plans if Russian President Vladimir Putin attacks NATO allies. The president comparing the unfolding conflict to China's deadly crackdown on pro-democracy protesters in 1989. I mean, talk about what happened in Tiananmen Square. That's Tiananmen Square Square. And this morning, the president unveiling another step to try to squeeze the Russian economy. The U.S. will start shipping more liquefied natural gas to Europe. We're coming together to reduce Europe's dependence on Russian energy. Putin has issued Russia's energy resources to coerce and manipulate its neighbors. He's used the profits to drive his war machine. But even after today's announcement, Europe, like China, India, and others, will still continue buying Russian oil and gas, providing Putin with a critical economic lifeline. It comes after the president wrapped up an emergency NATO summit in Brussels, where the U.S. and its allies announced new sanctions against Russian lawmakers and a billion dollars in humanitarian aid to Ukraine. But it's all fallen far short of what Ukraine's President Zelensky is pleading for, including tanks, fighter jets, and anti-ship weapons. Tonight, some Republicans saying President Biden is still not doing enough. He has this tendency to let the bad guy behave poorly first and then come in. We should have gotten more lethal uh, weapon systems into Ukraine when it was easy, uh, rather than again waiting for the invasion to happen. All right, Kristen joins us now from Warsaw. Kristen, you know, many of the president's critics have said they're waiting for that moment. They're waiting for the purpose of this trip. Why did President Biden go all the way to Europe? And we may get that reason over the next couple of days there in Poland. It's a really good point, Tom. President Biden is going to be meeting with refugees tomorrow. So he is going to see this humanitarian crisis firsthand. And of course, Poland is really the epicenter of this growing humanitarian crisis. So that is why tomorrow will be important. It's also going to be important because he's going to be delivering an address, what the White House has called a significant address, where he will lay out the steps that have been taken so far, the challenges that lie ahead, and everything. Everything that's at stake. Tom. Kristen, welcome for us tonight. Kristen, thank you for that. Tonight, we're getting an exclusive look inside Mariupol. Families huddling together in basements to hide from the relentless bombing, many without cell service, unable to share what's going on with the outside world. Gabe Gutierrez has the rare images from the besieged city. In Mariupol, no one is safe. Run fast, this mother says. Don't cry, run fast. The child does. Sobbing. This is a rare up-close look at the besieged port city from a family who endured weeks huddled in a dark, cold basement to escape the shelling. The pictures seem more at home in a history book than a smartphone. But this is 2022, and yet in southeastern Ukraine, they're scrounging for food and watching their lives burn. There is no way to describe this, Luba Marchenko says. She took those videos. This is her seven-year-old son, Artem. Those were his cries. He ran fast. 
God saved us and we survived, she says. What would you tell Putin? Please stop this madness, she responds. Lubov says the building above where they were staying was hit twice, so were others. They felt the blast wave. In a last ditch effort, they boarded a humanitarian bus to escape. We were on the bus and they started shelling in front of us, she says. We had to use another road. But they made it out to this bus in Lviv, bound for the Czech Republic. We're grateful from the bottom of our hearts, she says. Artem is no longer running. And we've just heard from them, Tom. They're now in the Czech Republic, hoping to eventually make it to Germany. But tonight, so many of their friends and family are still unreachable in Mariupol. Tom? And still living with the reality of what's going to happen to their country. All right, Gabe, thank you for that. For more on Russia's war strategy, we want to bring in retired Army Colonel Matt Dimmick. He's the former director for Russia and Eastern Europe at the National Security Council. Colonel, uh, a top Russian official said today that the main goal is the, quote, liberation of Donbass. That was the headline that Richard Engel was talking about there at the top of the broadcast. Putin has been saying all along that his goal is to liberate Russians in Ukraine. But what do you think about this announcement? It almost sounds like they're backtracking. Well, of course, they're backtracking. They've uh, taken stock of the situation and they're realizing that their initial war aims are just uh, completely out of their reach. They don't have the ability to accomplish any of those political objectives that Putin set out for them. So we're seeing a, a real time recalibration of what Russia thinks they can accomplish with the troops that they have and the force that they have. So they're retrenching to this uh, this sort of new made up uh, war aim of theirs, which I think is in the realm of the possible. They, they already uh, occupied 95% of Luhansk and a good majority of Donetsk. So if they can consolidate Mariupol, uh, capture a few other villages in Donetsk, they, they've got a real possibility of sitting on top of the two Donbass regions and maybe claiming victory, going to a ceasefire and and you know, calling an end to this thing. That's that's a potential outcome. Of course, the Ukrainians have got plenty to say about it. They may not even let the Russians occupy those two territories by the end of the Colonel, day. Colonel, our new reporting is that Russia is not stopping the bombing. They're actually stepping up. But we're also reporting that the Pentagon is assessing that Russia is bringing in reinforcements to Kherson, which they had control of over initially, but it's now contested territory tonight. The Pentagon has also reported that an estimated 15,000 Russian soldiers have been killed so far. What kind of losses does this mean to Russia as, an, as a complete fighting force? It's grievous losses for Russian ground forces. And, you know, when you count those kinds of troop losses, those losses are happening at the bleeding edge of the Russian military. So all of those combat units up at the front, they're the ones taking the most losses. And when a unit lo loses 10, 15, 20 percent, 30 percent even of their unit, they, they're starting to become combat ineffective. And that is really going to blunt Russia's ability to tear through Ukraine and capture any more objectives. So that that result in itself, I think, is is going to push Russia to some of these measures that they're they're having to, to go now and retrench from their positions and maybe focus on some more realizable objectives. Colonel, just briefly, because we don't have a whole lot of time here, the, the president tonight is in Poland, our president, President Biden. Has he accomplished anything on this trip? Has NATO accomplished anything this week? We'll see. A lot of the conversations happen behind closed doors, but uh, I'm sure that he probably set out, uh, we co probably accomplished what he uh, set out to do, and that was unite allies, make sure everybody's on board for the long haul. This is going to be many months of solidarity and working together that's required to keep the pressure on Russia and keep the, keep the sanctions in place. All right, Colonel Dimmick, we thank you for your analysis. Back here at home into Washington, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas facing growing calls to recuse himself from cases related to January 6th after it was revealed his wife sent a series of texts pushing to overturn the 2020 election results. Our Garrett Hake has the details. Three days after Election Day, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas texted Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, urging him to keep fighting the results. Do not concede, Ginny Thomas wrote. It takes time for the army who is gathering for his back. That text is one of 29 between Mrs. Thomas and Mr. Meadows, which he provided to the January 6th committee last year, according to a person familiar with the material. Quote, help this great president stand firm, Mark, she texted on November 10th. The majority knows Biden and the left is attempting the greatest heist of our history. In other texts, Mrs. Thomas pushed debunked conspiracy theories and offers advice for the Trump team. None of the text messages mention the court or Clarence Thomas directly. 
But critics argue the texts present a troubling conflict of interest for Justice Thomas. The lone dissent in an 8-1 to January Supreme Court ruling forcing Mr. Trump to turn over documents to the January 6th committee and who could be faced with other election or insurrection-related cases in the future. Should Clarence Thomas recuse himself from anything having to do with the 2020 election now? Absolutely. It's clear that his wife was involved in efforts to try to overturn the election. It's poten it's, there's a good possibility that he and his wife spoke about those efforts. Some Democratic lawmakers now calling for his recusal or resignation. Oregon Senator Ron Wyden writing, Justice Thomas' conduct on the Supreme Court looks increasingly corrupt. Republicans defending the court's longest tenured jurist. I think Justice Thomas could make his decisions like he's made them every other time. It's his decision based upon law. In an interview with the Washington Free Beacon earlier this month, Ginny Thomas said she and her husband stay in separate lanes, adding, Clarence doesn't discuss his work with me, and I don't involve him in my work. All right, Garrett joins us now from Capitol Hill. Garrett, has Justice Thomas or his wife put out any kind of statement or made any type of comment about this? We know there were reports concerning Justice Thomas's health earlier this week because he had to be hospitalized. Yeah, that's right. They have not, Tom. And believe me, it's not for lack of trying. I and just about every reporter on this beat have been trying to get more out of them. But this is par for the course. Uh, Ginny Thomas gave a statement to the Washington Free Beacon, which I mentioned in the piece, that she and, and the justice keep their affairs separate. That's as about as much as they said. But each one of these stories that comes out makes it harder and harder for them to walk that ethical line. As for the justice, the court said today he has been finally released from the hospital after a week of recovering from an infection. It wasn't COVID. That's all they've said about it. Garrett Hake for us tonight from Capitol Hill. Garrett, thank you. We want to talk a little more about this topic now. NBC News Justice Correspondent Pete Williams covers the Supreme Court for us. And Pete, if you don't mind tonight, I would like a little bit of a civics lesson. Who polices the Supreme Court? Essentially, who may be looking at this and saying whether this was right or wrong? Is that something for Chief Justice John Roberts? No, it's not. There's really the answer is nobody. It's up to each individual justice to decide these things for themselves. There are no ethics rules that apply to the justices, though they are guided by the laws that govern all federal judges. Supreme Court justices recuse or take themselves off a case a total of about 50 or so times a year, and that's mostly on whether the court should take up a case or not. They almost never explain why, but it's usually because they own stock in a company or they have a relative who's somehow involved in the case, something like that. And one reason why the justices don't recuse more often is that in the lower courts, when a federal judge recuses, somebody else in the courthouse can step in. There aren't any spare justices on the Supreme Court. I would guess Chief Justice John Roberts is not pleased by this controversy over Ginny Thomas but it's not something he's likely to talk to Justice Thomas about, Tom. Yeah, but clearly it's something the media Democrats are seizing on because there are questions that need to be answered. So from your years of covering the court, what is your gut telling you how this plays out? As Garrett reported there, Justice Thomas is not mentioned in the text that we know of so far, but could he be in trouble? I think a couple of things need to be said. First, as you say, there don't appear to be any messages about Justice Thomas, nothing from Meadows, for example, suggesting that his wife should talk to him, for example. That would be very serious. Secondly, we understand that her texts were among literally thousands that Mark Meadows received from people expressing similar views around the same time. Third, there's very little here that Ginny Thomas has not already said publicly. And fourth, I think Justice Thomas's views on, for example, executive privilege and the power and authority of the presidency are well known as well, and his dissent in January was consistent with that. Even so, she keeps doing this. She keeps doing things that increase the pressure on him to recuse, and it's a bit of a mystery why she keeps doing it, knowing that it raises these questions, Tom. Pete Williams for us tonight. Pete, we thank you for that. We want to turn now to a shocking and incredibly sad story out of Florida. A 14-year-old boy falling to his death at an amusement park in Orlando. Questions are swirling now about what went wrong to cause this fatal accident. Sam Brock has the latest on the investigation. 
Tonight, the first images of 14-year-old Tyree Sampson, moments before he tragically fell from an amusement park ride. That image, posted on Facebook by someone who raised questions about whether he appears to be properly secured. The company which operates that ride, Slingshot Group, says, we are cooperating with authorities and cannot speculate on a photograph or videos. 911 calls conveying the terror. The ride was going, and during the middle of the ride, the, the guy just came off. Yeah. How you going? <laughs> 430 feet. That's Samson was on the Orlando Free Fall, billed as the tallest attraction of its kind in the world. Let's Why does this have like the little cliff cliff, oh, like the seatbelt? Seat yeah. Right. Prior to the incident, video captures a rider asking about the seatbelt, which the company says doesn't click. Then as the free fall lifts, this. Hey, you check the seatbelt or left side? Seatbelt. No. no. Seatbelt. I've never encountered anything like this, so we are we are devastated. John Stein works for Slingshot Group, which operates three attractions at Icon Park. Before the ride, what kind of efforts are made to make sure that the harnesses are all properly secured? Yeah, we uh, again go go around to each individual and we ensure that that harness is locked in. And, and if it's not locked in, the ride will not operate. Tonight, state and local officials were on scene investigating how a site synonymous with joy instead became enveloped in tragedy. All right, Sam joins us now from Orlando. Sam, this is just a terribly sad story all around. What do we know about the victim here and, and what more are we learning about what happened over there? Yeah, so Tyree Sampson, Tom, is from St. Louis County. According to his dad and his football coach, he loved to play football. He was 6'6", about 300 pounds. Played, Tom, on a nationally recognized youth football team. Was not even in high school yet, but preparing for that step in his life. According to his coach, straight-A student, honor roll, mild-mannered and respectful, and now tragically lost. You know, Sam, you're, you're one of our correspondents that, that covers Florida for NBC News. There's so many theme parks in Florida and really all across the country. Well, what do we know about how they're inspecting these rides and, and whether they know they're safe or not on a day to day basis? So what's so odd about this situation is that this particular ride over my shoulder is only three months old. It was delayed because of the pandemic in terms of its construction, was only built in December of 2021. And the Florida Department of Agriculture here is responsible for overseeing amusement parks. They inspect it twice if it's a permanent structure like this one. One, when it's first put up, which did happen, I saw the report, nothing on there, totally clean. The second one is semi-annually, six months later, this particular ride did not even make it, of course, to six months until something like this happened, Tom. All right, Sam Brock with that new reporting tonight on that horrible story. Sam, thank you. Still ahead, the deadly fentanyl wave impacting children. A 12-year-old found unresponsive on a school bus after handling the sus substance. The family member now charged in his death. And what parents need to know to keep their kids safe. Plus, the library punch, an employee hit in the face, the unprovoked assault caught on camera and a vicious tiger attack in Florida. The heart racing moments after a man was mauled. The warnings the victim ignored before he was bitten. Top story, just getting started on this Friday night. We're back now with a terrifying accident involving fentanyl. And tonight we want to take a look at the brutal toll fentanyl takes even when children are poisoned. Deaths among teens from the drug tripling in the last two years alone. And some victims were killed without even knowing they were consuming it. NBC's Squad Venegas has that story. Tonight, more casualties in America's fentanyl crisis increasingly impacting children. A 12-year-old boy found unresponsive on a school bus. The boy would later die in a Philadelphia hospital, this according to the Camden County Prosecutor's Office. Now his 35-year-old uncle charged for his death. The prosecutor saying he forced a boy to clean up paraphernalia that contained fentanyl. It angers me, quite frankly. Uh, this 12-year-old who's just going to school is exposed to this these drugs that a 12 year old should not be exposed to. We could not immediately reach the man arrested or his lawyer for comment. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid tens of times more powerful than morphine and it is now the most common drug involved in overdose incidents in the country according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse. In January, a 13 year old boy overdosed at a school in Connecticut. I'm shocked. School is supposed to be a safe place. And just this week, 
Four more juveniles were taken to a hospital in Ohio after fentanyl was discovered in the air ventilation system of a detention center. Williams County Sheriff's Office now says everyone is accounted for and safe. Can you talk about uh, these exposures that do not result in overdoses versus one that would result in an overdose? If there's some on your finger and you happen to you know, lick, you lick your finger, or if there's a little bit of dust and you inhale some of that dust, now you've got a lot in much more quickly. And that's one of the problems with fentanyl is because it is so potent on a per molecule basis that it doesn't take much. The drug keeps showing up around teens. Preliminary data from the CDC crunched by the nonprofit advocacy group Families Against Fentanyl shows death among teens have tripled in the last two years. Many of them ingesting it unknowingly, like Jenny Bulbrecht's son, who died last year after taking a pill that was laced with fentanyl. It's just disgusting and it's heartbreaking. The CDC says more than 150 people in the U.S. are dying every day from a synthetic opioid overdose. Because of its potency, fentanyl is often added to other drugs, making them cheaper but much more deadly. My understanding is it's pretty much economics. There are cases of people getting what they think is cocaine, which actually has a little bit of fentanyl in it. And depending on the amount of fentanyl, uh, that can produce some serious, serious consequences, including death. A warning for Americans as U.S. law enforcement fights a war against the distribution of the deadly substance they say is being pushed by drug cartels. All right, Guad joins us now from 30 Rock. Guad, I know a lot of local and national governments and law enforcement are trying to prevent these fentanyl overdoses and there's some things they're doing on the local level but also on the borders to stop this uh, right tom so at a local level uh, some governments are trying to make what's called a fentanyl test strip more widely available this is really the only way to take a substance a pill the powder and see if it contains uh, fentanyl in it now if you look at the big picture when we spoke to the expert he said the problem here is that there is so much of this substance available in the country that's coming out from outside of the U.S., and that is why local police and the DEA are working hard to crack down on these uh, criminal organizations that are importing large amounts of uh, fentanyl into the U.S. Tom? Fentanyl test strips, it speaks to the, the growing problem we have in this country with that. All right, Guad, thank you for that. Now, wild video out of Florida following a tiger attack. An employee at an animal attraction mauled after he reached into a tiger enclosure. A warning some viewers might find the following footage disturbing. Zinclay Esamwa has more. Tonight, newly released body cam footage shows the shocking aftermath of a tiger attack at a Florida Everglades tourist attraction. Nacho, what were you doing in the cage? The man is seen here, lying on the ground, soon after a tiger clamped down on both his arms. I got you, buddy. According to the incident report released by the Collier County Sheriff's Office on March 22nd, the victim, an employee of Wooten's Everglade Airboat Tours, followed another worker to the tiger enclosure during feeding time. A witness, according to the incident report, said the victim attempted to put his hands through the fence to pet the tiger and kept trying even when he was told to stop. We need a ambulance bad. Someone just got attacked by a tiger. Once he had his hand in the enclosure, the tiger clamped down. His right uh, left arm is uh, pretty mangled. When police arrived, they put gauze bandages on the man's arms and kept him awake until medical assistance arrived. But this is just the most recent workplace tiger attack in the state. In December, a custodian at the Naples, Florida Zoo got his arms caught in a tiger's jaw while reaching into its cage. Oh my God, is that real? A responding officer shot the tiger in order to rescue the custodian, killing the cat in the process. A representative from prominent animal rights organization PETA is concerned. Tiger attacks happen a lot more frequently than, than people realize. Simply from someone reaching their arm into a tiger's cage. The man injured earlier this week was flown to the Gulf Coast Medical Center, according to our affiliate WBBH. NBC News was not able to confirm his condition. For its part, Wooten says the company is licensed by the state and federal government to care for tigers and is, quote, working with law enforcement in an ongoing going investigation of the incident. They say the tiger was not injured and remains in her enclosure. They are wild animals and they retain those wild instincts. Zinclair Samoa, NBC News. All right, when we come back, the murder suspect takedown. Police hunting down a man wanted for a deadly mosque attack. The tense confrontation caught on camera unfolding in a parking lot. Why the officers say they were forced 
to open fire. Stay with us. And we are back now with Top Stories News Feed. We begin with the police takedown after a deadly mosque attack in Florida. Body cam footage shows police surrounding a murder suspect at a parking lot in Vero Beach. Police say he broke into a mosque more than 100 miles away and beat a maintenance worker to death with a shovel. Deputies shot the suspect after he reached into his pocket and pretended to aim a gun at officers. He was taken to the hospital. All right, and police are searching for a suspect after a brutal and unprovoked attack at a library in Anaheim, California. New surveillance video shows the suspect punch a library employee in the face, sending him flying backwards and onto the floor. The victim was knocked unconscious and treated at a hospital. He's expected to be OK. No word yet on that suspect. ICE will no longer house undocumented immigrants at a controversial Alabama jail. The agency will discontinue use at Etowah County Detention Center. The facility had a longstanding federal contract with the federal government to house migrants there during proceedings with hundreds incarcerated there at any given time. Inspections and reports in recent years found issues with the facility's food service, health care and safety practices. And legendary WWE wrestler Triple H is retiring after 27 years in the ring. The Hall of Fame fighter saying today he will, quote, never wrestle again, citing health concerns. It comes after the 14-time world champion suffered heart failure last year. He will still serve as an executive with WWE. All right, next we want to continue our coverage from Ukraine. And tonight we introduce you to a group of men who gather in secret locations, learning how to assemble and shoot guns as they prepare to defend their country against Russian invaders. What they lack in experience, they make up for in grit. NBC's Ali Aruzi has their story. Most of these men have never fired a gun, let alone assembled one. They are volunteers who have left their normal lives behind to protect their country in Ukraine's territorial defense forces to fight the Russians. These people here are regular workers, owners of businesses. They understand clearly what they are doing here and what they have to learn. How many of these people have had any training? I mean, how many of these people even know how to use a gun before they came here? 0.0% of people. For security reasons, we're not allowed to disclose any locations, but their training is split between an indoor facility and an outdoor space. Their instructor, Andre, who used to be part of Ukraine's armed forces many years ago, left his construction business to help these new and very green recruits. They may not be trained soldiers, but they personify the Ukrainian fighting spirit, the patriotism you see from one and all here. Andre couldn't mask his disappointment, his outrage with NATO, palpable. I understand it's not their war, but if NATO is watching how are innocent children being killed, it is wrong to watch and think it is not their war. That's why we don't believe in NATO. We only believe in European American people. In the woods, they're given rudimentary training for a brutal war zone, firing paintballs at balloons. Taras was born when Ukraine was still part of the Soviet Union. At 64 years old, legally he doesn't need to fight and he can leave the country, an option that was out of the question for him. I'm a pensioner. I am 64. I could leave the country, but when the motherland is in danger, men have to defend, not run away from the country. I asked Harris if he had a message for President Biden. He wished him good health and said they really need support from the U.S. He had a very different message for Russia's leader. And a message for Putin? <laughs> for Putin, I'll have a message from here. I think a lot of Ukrainians have that same mission. Ali, uh, same message. Ali Aruzi joins us now live from Lviv tonight. Ali, you know, it's interesting. Russia is neighbors with Ukraine. They share a border. And yet it seems the Russian military and their intelligence services gravely underestimated how brave these Ukrainians would fight the men of Ukraine taking up arms like this. And you just see it right there in your story. 
Uh, that's right, Tom. Well, we're a month into this conflict, and the Ukrainians have defied all the odds. Despite being outnumbered and outgunned, they've mostly stalled the Russian invasion, which hasn't gone according to plan. Uh, they have held on to much of their territory. They've held on to the capital. Uh, they haven't let the Russians encroach on them. And that, in part, is not only due to the Russian, uh, to the Ukrainian army, but also those regular citizens that we spoke to. They're determined to save their country, their sovereignty, and their people, and they're digging in for a long fight ahead. Tom? Ali Aruzi tonight, part of our big team out there covering every aspect of this war. Ali, we thank you for that. Now to Money Talks, a look at what consumers need to know from the business world and beyond. Record-breaking inflation and an ongoing labor shortage hitting Americans hard. Prices soaring from the gas pump and now to your lunch break. NBC's Joe Lynn Kent explains. With millions heading back into the office again, workers are forking over more for lunch. Popular lunch spots like Sweet Green saying they're raising their prices in what's being called lunchflation. When you see prices going up for lunch, what runs through your head? Who's spending like $15 for a salad they can make at home? The price you pay at restaurants overall is up nearly 7% in the last year alone, the biggest jump since 1981. According to the tech company Square, the price of a wrap is up 18% since last year, a sandwich rising 14%, salads soaring 11%, and burgers spiking 8%. Nationwide, even taco prices have risen 12%. These hikes are due to labor shortages and the skyrocketing costs of ingredients. It's kind of hard because I'm on a budget. I don't have a, like a ton of money to like spend and stuff. And for consumers who think bringing lunch will solve this problem, well, you're in for a surprise. Groceries cost 8.6% more than a year ago, including record-breaking prices for lunch meat. Shoppers sounding off on social media, saying, maybe I just wasn't used to buying a lot of groceries, but this was $100? Are you making any ad other adjustments in your life so you can still grab a taco and go out for lunch? Yeah, generally just buying less. I've started eating a lot more toast, which sounds really sad. All my friends make fun of me because I'll eat toast for lunch or toast for dinner. Some employers are trying to soften the blow by subsidizing lunches, while some restaurants are offering special lunch deals. To save where you can, experts say it's still cheaper to bring your own lunch and opt for generic brands. Avoid expensive add-ons, use savings apps and coupon sites, and track your spending to find other places to save. So your desk lunch doesn't eat too much into your budget. Adding to the sticker shock here, wages are lagging behind this rapid inflation, making that lunch you buy at work even more expensive. But you could see prices come down in the next 6 to 12 months, with the Federal Reserve planning to continue to raise interest rates as it tries to get this high inflation under control. We thank Jolene Kent for that. It is Friday night. You know what that means. It is Dateline tonight. The story tonight of a family gathering that ended in tragedy 49-year-old Norman Lee Radler found dead one December morning in 2010. Investigators tried to unravel the question at the heart of this case. Was it murder or suicide? Dateline's Keith Morrison has a preview. It was an early winter morning, December 30th, 2010. Outside, it was very dark. Inside, ice melted in glasses half full of vodka. And finally, silence descended on the house. Do you remember going to bed that night? I remember saying, I, I got to go to bed because I got to get up early. Any idea how much you had to drink? Probably quite a bit of wine. And then a single gunshot. It was Rob who discovered his son-in-law, Lee, clearly dead, lying on the kitchen floor. It is horrific and numbing to see someone you love lying there dead. I remember walking out and looking and just not even believing this, just saying, what, what are you doing? It didn't look real, said Belinda, certainly not in her still inebriated days. You thought they were putting on some sort of act for you? I thought it was like a, a bad joke. I really did. But it wasn't, of course, not a joke at all. Instinct kicked in then. Rob, the cop turned attorney, called 911 around 5 a.m. 911, what's your emergency? He shot himself. I don't get it. He shot himself. 
All right, Dateline's Keith Morrison joins us now. Keith, this is a strange one. You have cocktails, you have family talking, and then what sounds like suicide, but this is Dateline, so it's likely murder. How did police piece this one together? Boy, this was a cautionary tale on many levels, I must tell you. Um, but the piecing together uh, followed a pattern which I've seen more than a few times over the course of a long time watching these things where uh, somebody made an initial impression and they sort of followed it from there. The actual answer to what may have happened that night was a much more complicated business uh, with everybody in a state of, state of alcoholic stupor who could know who did what. And whether it was murder or whether it was suicide, all we knew was that somebody was dead and that the gun that somebody was dead with was owned by one of the other participants in the uh, all night party. But <laughs> who held the gun? It was a real, it was a complex puzzle. And the problem with complex puzzles in the legal system is that they can sometimes go on and go on and go on and flip and flop and go back and forth. This was quite a tale. Keith, you've done hundreds of these cases. What was something that really surprised you about this one? Because from the get-go, it just sounds like there's a lot of twists and turns here. Uh, whoa, the surprises really were probably in the relentlessness of an effort to uh, come to a certain type of conclusion in this case where it maybe wasn't warranted. And in the end, um, a whole lot of time and a whole lot of people's lives were uprooted because of it. All right, Keith, as usual, you have hooked us. We will be watching and you can watch the full story and all new episode of Dateline at 9 p.m. Eastern on the mothership NBC. All right, coming up, oil attack, a massive fire ripping through an oil facility in Saudi Arabia after it was hit with a missile. The group now claiming responsibility. Stay with us. We are back now with Top Stories Global Watch, and we begin with a suspected missile attack on an oil facility in Saudi Arabia. Video shows massive flames ripping through the oil plant in Jeddah as the city prepares to host the Formula One Grand Prix. Yemen's Iran-backed Houthi rebels have claimed responsibility. The facility is just 10 miles from the Formula One track, but the event will go on still as scheduled. China is grounding hundreds of Boeing 737 aircrafts after a deadly crash earlier this week. Officials say the aircrafts will undergo safety inspections and maintenance. It comes after that type of plane crashed into a mountainous region in southern China, killing all 132 passengers on board. The cause is still under investigation. And Coldplay has kicked off their one-of-a-kind sustainability tour in Costa Rica. The concert will be powered by solar tiles and a battery made from recycled BMW materials. The battery will be run by the fans. Check this out, using their movement on a kinetic floor and bikes. The band, who vowed in 2019 to stop touring until they found an eco-friendly way to do it, will not travel on private planes and use electric cars on the ground. Glad to see them back out on tour. An update on a story we brought you last night. We ended our broadcast with, you may remember Cole Phillips, the University of Arkansas superfan who was blind. He got to cheer on his beloved Razorbacks to victory with his dad as they defeated number one Gonzaga. The father and son duo sent us these images from the game and this video. They will now get to see the Hogs face off against Duke in the Elite Eight tomorrow night. We are rooting for Arkansas and for them. Such a great story. Thanks so much for watching Top story this week. I'm Tom Yama. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.